Good afternoon, almost evening, everyone. Um, you, uh, Your Excellencies and esteemed colleagues, I'm honored to participate in this essential conversation. Across the globe, we are witnessing increasing virulent xenophobic sentiments and repressive immigration policies. Emerging research now strongly suggests that this xenophobic social hostility has cascaded into schools, contributing to toxic learning environments for both educators and students. In my time today, I consider the role of social belonging and its antithesis, social exclusion in the form of xenophobia, for schools, immigrant origin children, and for the future of our societies and suggest ways in which schools must play a role in countering cascading xenophobia. I would like to begin with a brief consideration of the extent to which immigrant origin children are aware of xenophobic uh, attitudes. To gain some insight into whether they register group antipathy, we asked 400 newcomer youth to complete a simple fill-in-the-blank task. Sorry, I'm not getting it to go. Okay, so we asked them to re respond to most Americans think Dominicans, if they were Dominican or Chinese, are. The data was just a small part of a, a but highly illustrative part of a longitudinal study of immigrant origin student adaptation drawn from youth arriving from five points of origin, Asia, from Asia, the Caribbean, and Latin America to the United States. 65% of the children filled in the blank with a negative term. The most frequent word was the word bad, though many wrote in more elaborate responses. Most Americans think we are useless. We are garbage. We are members of gangs. We can't do the same things as them in school or at work. We don't exist. Most Americans think that we are lazy gangster drug addicts that only come to take their jobs away. We also found that the ways in which participants completed the sentence was related to their family's country of origin. While a little less than half of the Chinese youth completed the sentence with a negative term, 82% of Dominicans did for example. Thus, young immigrants are clearly aware of negative attitudes about them to the host society. The need to belong is a powerful, fundamental, and extremely pervasive social motivation and human need. Humans are a social species. They long to belong across a variety of domains, including kinship groups, places of work, places of worship, schools, clubs, political groupings, social movements, and of course, the nation state. Upon entering a new setting, individuals routinely ask themselves, do I belong here? The converse of social belonging is the well-theorized concept of social exclusion. For members of stigmatized groups, including, for example, people with disabilities, people of color, immigrants, members of the LGBTQ community, among others, however, a sense of social belonging is routinely compromised and at risk across a variety of domains, including the social, political, spatial, labor market, educational, and relational. Xenophobia is a particular form of social exclusion, inflaming and legitimizing toxic rhetoric directed against immigrants and their children. Immigrants, or their, those perceived as such, become the quintessential other in the public ima imagination, delating, delineating who is us and who is them and who may be conditionally allowed to join. Xenophobia serves to normalize stereotypes of danger, criminality, sloth, disease, and filth. It pits newcomers against long-standing residents via perceptions of competition over scarce resources as it delineates who has the right to be cared for by the state and society. 
The terms of permission of who is deserving and who is not are historically manipulated according to economic and political wins. Erica Lee has painstakingly examined the case of the United States. While the US has cultivated a foundational myth of a nation of immigrants, it has concurrently had a parallel tradition of recurring waves of virulent xenophobia exemplified by, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese family internment camps, Operation Wetback, which repatriated over a million individuals of Mexican origin, including many US citizens, and the recent Muslim ban. Xenophobia can, and often is, intertwined with racism. While immigrants have long been racialized, the pattern of response has been exacerbated in the last half century when uh, immigrants are increasingly people of color, hailing from Latin America, Asia, the Caribbean, and Africa. Thus, immigrant origin people of color, including those in the third generation and beyond, are more likely to experience discrimination associated with being a perpetual foreigner. For the phenotypical, for the phenotypically marked, becoming a full member of a white dominant society is often thwarted by perceptions of perpetual outsiderhood. For immigrants, xenophobia and the resulting enacted policies contribute to structural exclusion in a variety of ways, beginning with policies on quotas for entry. Immigrant policies are ever shifting depending upon the political winds and are typically shaped by economic priorities, rapid demographic changes, as well as political crises. For the unauthorized immigrant population, deportation and the perennial threat to the self as well as to loved ones is or, or the is leaves no ambiguity when one is being expelled from society for unauthorized unauthorized individuals and citizen children the continued threat of ejection compromises belongingness in myriad ways just how does one establish a sense of belonging to a society that clearly signals through overt actions, you and your family do not belong? Social exclusion also actively structures access to resources, including fair working conditions, housing, health care benefits, and education, among others. Further, legal status blocks access to such everyday necessities as social security numbers, driver's licenses, and bank accounts. While citizen children of unauthorized parents are eligible for these benefits, as Hiro has beautifully, uh, ele elegantly demonstrated, their parents are often fearful of revealing their own legal status and thus avoid securing such benefits for their children. Children living in unauthorized families are less likely to be enrolled in programs that helps uh, foster their early learning, such as uh, preschool programs. These conditions have unsurprising negative consequences for academic, cognitive, and behavioral development for children. While Structural impediments and exclusion have clear implications for social belonging. So do, a, so do a variety of forms of symbolic violence. Exclusionary social messages marginalize, silence, reject, segregate, disenfranchise, and extend to all those perceived as other. The immigrant recognizes legal or not, as well as those associated with potential foreign origins. These social messages are transmitted to those who presumably do not belong and are rendered all the more powerful when they are internalized. And think back to those children and their sentences. The resulting identity threats can linger for years to create isolation that negatively impacts well-being, academic self-efficacy, and performance in students. The polarizing discourses on immigration have made unauthorized immigrants, in particular, a frequent target of vitriol by politicians persistently played out in mainstream and social media. These narratives reinforce negative stereotypes, legitimizing unabashed acts of covert and overt discrimination. 
exposure to this symbolic violence, whether directly experienced or vicarious, have significant negative implications for both physical and psychological health. As policymakers have debated immigrant, immigration reforms, a generation of immigrant children with ambiguous status have come of age in limbo and are still waiting. In the meantime, toxic rhetoric has dramatically increased with cascading effects insidiously finding their way into our educational settings. What does this mean for schools? Increasingly, teachers, principals, school counselors, and other staff report the ripple effects of our anti-immigrant socio-political context, particularly for immigrant origin students. A survey of 3,600 educators across the United States found that 85% had observed, and I'm quoting here, overt expressions of fear of immigrant enforcement among their immigrant origin students. Further, 79% of participants reported emotional or behavioral problems among their immigrant students, which interfered with their learning. Immigrant origin students often enter schools having undergone a series of stresses and traumas. Children and families are frequently exposed to a number of highly stressful events at a variety of junctures. These compound traumas are rarely processed or entirely resolved before another trauma is experienced, which in turn affects developmental and relational growth. These are particularly acute for those who have escaped violence in their home countries or who have undergone arduous journeys as they seek safety in the new homeland, as well as for children and youth growing up in mixed status families who live in chronic fear that beloved family members will suddenly be detained or deported. The cascading xenophobia finding their way, its way into classrooms add to this cumulative trauma of these, these children and youth. In short, the adversity and risk many immigrants encounter before, during, and after immigration can complicate the adaptation process and activate toxic stress. A growing body of research on trauma has demonstrated both the long-term health implications of exposure to trauma, as well as the short-term implications for social-emotional functioning, motivation, and cognition. Simply put, traumatized students cannot learn optimally. Traumatic exposure negatively affects students' learning at school by decreasing students' ability to focus attention, I lost my track, sorry. They, f f f attention, regulate emotions and behavior, as well as to develop positive relationships with adults and peers. Students who have been exposed to trauma often view the world as a perilous place. Day-to-day -day events can trigger fight, flight, or freeze survival responses that are not under the student's control, resulting in students being less able to engage in problem solving, rational thought, or learning. The cascading effects of xenophobic social climate are finding their ways into classroom in other ways. A national survey of over 500 school principal conducted by our colleague and friend uh, John Rogers in the United States found a widespread increase in incivility across schools with, an, and I'm quoting here, an overwhelming majority of principals reporting problems such as contentious school environments, hostile exchanges across the class, and demeaning and hateful remarks over political views, close quote. In particular, 60% of participating principals reported that they had encountered issues around derogatory comments about immigrants, often drawing upon Trump's build the wall rhetoric. The survey of 3,600 educators I mentioned earlier found particularly high incidence of bullying towards immigrant origin students in schools with higher percentages of white students. The problematic school climates that these students point to, these studies point to, should give us pause. Developmental scientists and educators have now brought together ample evidence demonstrating that schools and class climate have important implications for social emotional functioning, motivation, and learning. Social scientists are demonstrating uh, what students, parents, principals, and good teachers have always known. A healthy classroom climate is essential for optimal learning. 
yet educational settings find themselves at the front lines of toxic, uncivil conversations with, concur with a concurrent mandate to provide sanctuary learning environments so that their students can thrive with little in the way of a compass on how to perceive, how to proceed. A parallel concern for our current and future civil societies is the growing social empathy gap, which here Yoshikawa has referred to as a severe crisis of disconnection. The xenophobic public climate has serious ramifications for our sense of social unity. At a time of extraordinary demographic, uh, at a time of an extraordinary demographic shift, our societies need to encounter the need to counter the pressures to divide them from us by fostering cohesive social relations and strengthening the bonds of solidarity between both new and more established members of society. Schools must work to disrupt the narratives of exclusion and division, nurturing practices of inclusion and shared membership into the family of the nation and indeed the world across educational settings. Now, more than ever, it is a primary responsibility of schools to bring the ideals of citizenship and democratic, democratic principles to life, fostering a sense of citizenship in the broadest sense around our responsibilities and obligations to each other and for the public good. Educators already challenged with educational reforms sharply focused on assessments find themselves ill-equipped to address xenophobia, trauma, and other consequences. Educators have minimal preparation for how to either address the needs of their diverse newcomer students or manage difficult conversations around cascading xenophobia that trickle into classrooms. As such, what are the fundamental, fundamental issues that educational settings must address? Increasingly, it is recognized that in order to promote both short-term learning as well as long-term success, and developmental, uh, development of students, education must expand beyond a narrow focus on academic achievement. At a minimum, a whole child perspective includes a focus on supporting and promoting student health and well-being, engaging the family and community in sustaining ways, providing learning environments that are safe, supportive, and caring, as well as providing a challenging education that prepares students for the future. In regards to addressing the needs of immigrant origin students, I would like to suggest the following as essential. First, this work mu must begin with an understanding of the children educators serve. At a minimum, all teachers must be well grounded in an understanding of the realities of the migratory experience and its effects on families and children. In the US alone, 26% of all children are the ch children of immigrants. This is across the country, not in LA, New York, etc. And this is true for almost all post-industrial nations. Second, given the pervasive trauma uh, of in immigrants' uh, students' lives, educators must begin by becoming familiar with the types of traumas and chronic stressors these children and families are exposed to. Further, they should be aware of how students' behavioral and attentional problems may be secondary to trauma and anticipate and take note of potential triggers. Trauma-informed educational practice uh, requires predictable classroom routines and, develops, uh, and developing de-escalation routines uh, for students who may become triggered. It is essential to foster warm, safe classroom contexts where relationships are cultivated between teachers and students and among students. Further, at a minimum, classrooms are spaces where students should feel recognized and respected. An important strategy for cultivating conduct, uh, conducive learning environments is by providing culturally responsive pedagogy. At its most basic level, uh, at its most basic level, cult res culturally responsive pedagogy incorporates elements of diverse students' historical and cultural legacy by including literature on his and, uh, and historical reference to, to diverse figures and events. Optimally, culturally relevant education provides deep learning opportunities to consider and discuss 
multiple perspectives and encourages students to strive for solutions to existing social problems. By engaging in this work, educators have the opportunity to highlight students' commonalities while acknowledging their individuality, serving to foster positive intergroup relations and self-awareness. The discussions that arise as students grapple with these issues when well managed, and I underline that, can serve to bridge a uh, difference by providing new perspectives and ways of understanding. A strategy to break the patterns of division, stereotyping, and prejudice is to find ways to minimize the distance across perceived difference. Certainly the profound social empathy gap faced by so many of our societies today will not likely be easily bridged as biases are deeply held. A starting point, however, is through the lens of empathy, the capacity to, actually, to accurately understand the position of others and feel that this could happen to me. Alone, neither the emotional nor the cognitive dimensions of empathy are effective for bridging the empathy gap. One has to imagine another's dilemma and explicitly place oneself into the position of the other. And I agree with Leslie. Uh, narratives are an extraordinarily powerful vehicle for making that happen. Classrooms are spaces in which diverse groups of students can, regulate, uh, can regularly come in contact and come to know one another, recognizing that perceived differences are less than imagined. Scaffolded curriculum and well-managed classroom dialogues should be places where students are exposed to new perspectives, experiences, and ways of thinking. Classrooms can and should be spaces of sustained conversations where perspectives are exchanged, imagined, and civilly debated. As politicians and social media enact an ethos of discord, divisiveness, and hatred, educators must foster classrooms that are sites of possibilities, in the words of Michelle Fine, where an ethic of civility and respect are modeled daily. At a time where it seems everyone is shouting, the classroom must be a place of careful listening. And I love Carlina's term, a pedagogy of listening. Sigal Ben Porath has eloquently suggested schools should serve to prepare the next generation of citizens by cultivating a shared fate. She defines this shared fate as a relational, processed, process-oriented dynamic affiliation that accommodates diversity while maintaining a common foundation. Educating for joint fate connects our very identity to the good of others and recognizes that reciprocity is at the heart of citizenship. The obligation of every school and every educator should be to foster a democratic ethos where immigrant children come to feel they are full members and cont contributors to the community with a shared fate, continuously endeavoring to foster a sense of we. Educated, education must strive to bridge the empathy gap between relative newcomers and perceived outsiders and those who, and, and those who self identity who self-identify as long-term citizens or insiders. In short, a central task of education today is to consistently nourish a sense of our common humanity. More than ever, we must draw upon ample historical lessons that remind us with hindsight of shameful xenophobic acts of exclusion and mass complicity. In, the increasing, in these increasing uncivil times, the well-being of millions of children and youth and our societies are at stake. Thank you very much. <laughs>